if it really bothered me. The ones that really bothered me when I encountered them are the ones that have been very important in my life. When something really bothers me, especially when it's an idea, it asks me, it, uh, I usually raise this question, why is this idea the way it is? Why is it being accepted? And why not some of the ideas that, are, that is flourishing the world right now? So for example, why your classical uh, ideology, and why not some of the ideology is so powerful right now? That not that a uh, legitimate question to raise? Sure. Sure. That is, yes. I have uh, one question, just on, I guess, on some of the Eastern Europe. I was wondering if you could shed some light. It seems like <clears throat> a lot of historical nuance is ignored with regards to what's going on in Greece right now, like with the East Don, for example. So do you have any insights? With the what, for example? With the situation in Greece right now and the economic turmoil and, I guess, now humanitarian crisis there. So I was wondering if you had any, maybe, insight on, on what, on how, I guess, economic policy with regards to Greece should be approached yes. now? Oh, well, I've had this idea from the beginning of when they began, when they decided to create the euro. It seemed like a horrible idea from day one to me. It seemed like the one thing that I took as a graduate student, because you have to take what there are professors for, and I took and I took a specialization based on which professors I thought could teach me something. <laughs> Since they're all gone now, I'm not going to insult any of them. There aren't any of them around anymore. But the well, one professor that was around that I thought could teach me something was in international monetary theory. And I actually took a, a, a field in that, but I've never taught it ever since I got out of graduate school. But I have thought about it a lot. And you cannot have a monetary theory, a, mon a money supply, it seems to me, this is my own conclusion, you cannot have a money supply where the, the government has no control of the money supply and the fiscal and monetary policy cannot be coordinated in any way because the government, see, in order for the euro to succeed, in order for stability, in order for things to work out in Europe, the Greek government and the Italian government and all those governments have to become like state governments in the United States. And there has to be a European government that's like the American federal government. And I don't see that happening. So what I predict, and I have no idea when this is going to happen, but I predict the euro will fail. At some point, the human cost is going to be so significant with unemployment, crisis, difficulty, riots in the streets and everything, that the, that the euro will fail. Because I cannot believe that those different countries, Greece and Italy and Spain and France and Germany, every one of those countries are going to give up their political autonomy and create a strong central government in which they lose their political autonomy. And I can't believe uh, that uh, fiscal and monetary policy is going to work out when they don't have it. So since I can't believe that, I believe the euro will fail. The only country that used their head at all in joining that was England, who kept their pound. And, and, they could, and the reason they could do it is they were so powerful, and the pound was such a powerful currency, they could do that. And they won't be really drastically harmed when the euro fails. But uh, I think it will fail. And I think in the meantime, until it does fail, places like Greece are going to suffer a lot. They're going to suffer. And all I think that was an asinine idea that they had to create the euro in the first place. Now, would you suggest that there's not many riots and protests? I mean, there are, but not to a large scale as we're seeing in Europe and the United States is because of the balance, balanced budget ideology has gotten so infused into the American system that you know, they just accept it because if they know their economics, they know that they can spend as much. There is no debt problem in the United States, but so many Americans are made to believe such nonsense and hopefully don't have many. Well, there was an interesting uh, column by Krugman a while back. He says that uh, there is this short-term 
propaganda machine. He says it's similar to the propaganda machine that led us into war in Iraq that has caused us just to forget all about Keynesian economics and lead to this thing. And he said it's, it's come in the last four years, five years, and it's come from right-wing people who want to, who have never really accepted New Deal reforms and have never really accepted uh, uh, Medicare and Social Security and all these things and want to roll them back. Ideally, they'd like to eliminate them, but they don't really see total elimination, but certainly roll them back. And uh, so, and, and he made an interesting point in that column that he wrote on that. He said uh, exactly the same debate was going on in the 1930s with all the same dire consequences predicted. And he said, and, and he said the interesting point is the debt from World War II has never been paid off. <laughs> it's never been paid off, so the debt has increased steadily ever since World War II, and nobody thinks about the disaster that World War II debt has never been paid off. So why does that ideology work so well here in the United States? I mean, how is it able to Fear, so fear, that when you whip up ideology like that, yeah. it's like the fear of the nuclear weapons hitting the United States with Iran, I mean, with Iraq, and uh, it's it's fear they, they were saying there's going to be severe inflation where clearly no inflation was on the thing so and and in Krugman's column today or yesterday I can't remember who I saw it. I see it two days in a row because I read the New York Times and I read then it's in the Tribune the next day and uh, but uh, uh, the now he said they're they're giving up on all their old arguments now they're saying it's so unfair to to saddle the next generation with this debt. Now they're just doing fairness. It'd be so fair if we just screwed the old people. <laughs> cut them off from just cut them off from all medical care. And, and cut them down, let them starve, let them go out in the gutter, and then would be fair. But uh, you know the hardly anyone mentions it, but the, if if there's any problem with Social Security. The fix is so easy. All they have to do is charge the Social Security tax to all income. And that would eliminate the problem totally. Through, In fact, I was reading someone, I can't remember who, saying through the 21st century, well into the 22nd century, that Social Security would be solvent if they would just have... So all of us in this room, I presume there are no billionaires in this room, are going to pay Social Security tax on all of our income. But uh, Mitt Romney is going to pay one one hundredth of one percent Social Security tax on his income, and that's that's the easy answer. But uh, well, it's solvent until two thousand seventy-five. Yeah, uh, yeah. Dave Baker wrote that book, uh, The Phony Crisis, and said, "Like, look, I know, I know, the it's, trust uh, fund is there. I mean, this is all a bunch of." Well, you know, I used to teach this class. The, my favorite class that I ever taught, and I just cried when they eliminated. Uh, the, the liberal education college at the University of Utah, because I used to teach this class uh, called Capitalism and Authoritarianism. And uh, I would start the first class. Was, I loved to teach this class. It was a lib ed class. It wasn't in the economics department at all. I would start the class, the first day of class, and I would tell them, if any words in the English language offend you, I'm going to have a 15 minute break in a few minutes. Go withdraw from the class. Do not take the class if there's a single word that offends you. And so I'd have this break and then they'd come back from the break and then I'd have a litany of about 30 of the most vulgar and some people think rotten words that you can even imagine that you've ever heard that your mother would have washed your mouth out with. So, and uh, said, okay, I'll take another break if any of those offended you because I had this really interesting group of writers that uh, argue, that were arguing that that connection of why those words are offensive are connected to what they call the authoritarian personality of people who identify 
with power. See, that's I, they're the same ones who think if if gay people kiss each other and much less kiss something else on each other, uh, <laughs> that's so disgusting we can't even think of it. And to allow them to marry is the most horrible thing on earth. And uh, you know, there's some those people identify upward. And if powerful people say, this is bad, they'll say, that's bad. And powerful people say, you should have less, they should say, I should have less. You know, there are people who are basically uh, masochistic toward themselves and other people like them in their social class. And I, I had a lot of literature that I went through, and it was really a fun class. I went through it in that class. and. Uh, uh, I, it had a little flair. I didn't use those words all that much. But, uh, <laughs> but see, I started out by saying Shakespeare said, a rose by any other name would smell as sweet. Well, making love and fucking doesn't sound the same <laughs> to most people. <laughs> so, anyway, and then I'd say a lot worse things than that. <laughs> but, 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 I haven't, but I haven't warned all of you, so I'll, I'll, I'll tone it down right now before I say it more. Anyway, yes. Um, I have a, a teaching question. Sure. Um, you know, I thought so if you were teaching undergraduates history of thought today, you know, in today's climate and everything, and, and realizing that many of us will be in departments that maybe don't have as much, uh, you know, pluralism in them, and so you get, you have really just one sort of class, one three credit probably class to teach history of thought. Um, in your book you do, you know, you show that history of thought is, studying it is not just uh, for pleasure, although I agree that it is, but there's a model there. There's the classical model, and, and for yeah. me that's the, the you know, a, an important reason to study it. There's a model that proceeds from production and, and yes. you know, looks at the big picture that, that uh, corresponds to reality. And so, uh, you know, you have this opportunity to teach that model that is completely lost and isn't in, you know, the neoclassical, or you know, you also have an opportunity to critique neoclassical, you know, yes. and you do both. I mean, and I love the way that you know you begin that with showing the beginnings of, of these yes. two strands in Adam Smith. Um, given that you only have three credits, where do you focus your time? Because I've tried to do both, and it confuses students <laughs> when you only have one one semester. That's exactly. In fact, I should have let you give the lecture on why you should study that kind of. That's exactly what I have. <laughs> That's exactly what I had in mind when I wrote the book. That's exactly, because I think those two things do. And, and I noticed that before I wrote the book, and that was an idea I had, because I had noticed that um, you really got to, on a three hour, one semester course, you really have to cut down. There are only, you'd have to cut down to the main things that illustrate those, I would say, you'd have to really cut out at least half, if not more, of what's there. Because you know, mm -hmm. it, it is hard. It is hard because uh, to really to really teach this, and, and it's better now that Mark Lautzenheiser helped me by going through because he put some of the more abstract stuff into an appendix, mm -hmm. and so it's a little bit better for undergraduates now than it used to be. Uh, but for an undergraduate thing, it would take a full year mm -hmm. to, to go through that, it would easily a full year, and it would be gung-ho good students who would read it all in a year, it would be. Uh, you know, I'd have to just really look at that and think about it a lot on what you would do. I think I would tend to still include John Stuart Mill and Adam Smith both because they both do have sort of both approaches within them. And uh, it's only after Mill that you get the universal separation, I think, thereafter. And so I, I'm not sure before Mill. That, that's where the problem lies, because you know, there's a lot between Adam Smith and Mill. And, yeah, that's a hard question, but it is. I, Oh boy. I'm glad you see it that way though because you'd be the perfect person if I was a department chair and wanted someone to teach it. I'd, 
hope that I could find a person <laughs> who would have in mind exactly. He just wants more time to teach it. Yeah. <laughs> if I was department chair, I'd say, let's make this a two course, <laughs> two semester course for you. Yeah. <laughs> I find it. I, I have. I found it difficult because I have been teaching that class, and and on the one hand, building and developing a model that is quite foreign to students, but but actually quite, you know, approachable. You know. Uh, yes. But also the importance and significance of, of critiquing the, the showing the critiques of the, the dominant yes. paradigm, and I, I find a, myself sort of torn, and I sort of moved around on how much of each I do, and just kind of wondered, you know, if you were teaching today, would you think it more important just to sort of teach the classical model or to critique? No, I think the critique, in fact. Do you that's what, that's what I told Jerry Gray when I visited, and he was thinking of trying to simplify his curriculum. It's really difficult. It's really difficult. That's such a dilemma. It's a huge dilemma. It's a, I just don't know. Yeah. But since you have the right idea, I'm convinced you could handle it as well as anyone. Not that you could handle it without any difficulty, but that you can handle it as well as anyone. I may call on your endorsement one. <laughs> yeah. um, so what if, uh, what if we're trying to reimagine this cliche, the undergraduate curriculum? Uh, suppose um, the only constraint we were working under was that a student can only take so many courses. But uh, let's forget about accreditation and other kinds of, or not completely forget about them, but, but not make them the focus. What do you think an ideal undergraduate economics curriculum would look like? Well, unfortunately, I do think that the, that the profession has us by the short hairs. I think you can't do anything about doing principles and in intermediate theory. I think you have to, or I think you will penalize your students later. I think that's just, I think that's just the power of the profession. I would like if there's room to have a full year of history of economic thought. I would add that and then that's all the required ones there would be. Would I you would put that before principles or I'd, between I'd principles put it and be, intermediate? I would put I would put it between principles and intermediate myself. Or so simultaneous with intermediate, maybe. Either between or simultaneous. I'd have to think about that. I don't know. Because in a way It'd be better if they had intermediate because then they'd see this critique that Kristen was talking about. But uh, I don't know. But uh, I've thought about also eliminating principles because uh, intermediate theory can be done with no background. The problem that uh, in principles does offer something that intermediate theory doesn't that students need, and that is they have this whole thing on principles on the banking system and how money is created and all that that's not usually into intermediate theory that actually is one of the few practical things that students get <laughs> by taking economics so you don't want to eliminate every practical thing they get so so you know I don't know that's that's really us I talked to Jerry and I, I don't I mean he was hoping I'd give him some expert advice and I said all I can tell you, Jerry, is that I'm just dumbfounded. <laughs> said, Damn, you weren't any help at all. <laughs> okay, this has been a great discussion, and it apparently could go on for hours. <laughs> so I, I really do think that we need to thank him for coming, and maybe he'll stick around and ask a few more, answer a few more questions. I think. <laughs>
I was making a joke that I hated Shepard. Yeah, that's what I love. I thought he was Well, Miguel, we got to know that you're going on the 